Before we get into this week's Nurses Uncorked, we wanted to give a big thank you and a shout out to our newest patron, um, which is just like Patreon. It's our newest uh, supporter of Nurses Uncorked. Her name is Alicia. Alicia is a Grand Ooh. Preserve member. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Welcome, thank Alicia. You, thank you Alicia. so much. We appreciate it greatly. Um, we could not do it without con continued support. Um, and if anyone else would like to join um, and become one of our patrons, uh, the website, you can check things out. Our web address is HTTPS with the slashes, P-A-T-R-O-N dot podbean dot com slash N-U-P. Um, any, any support you can do is greatly appreciated. We have lots of cool stuff and, um, things that we're, we're doing. You're getting early episodes, uh, before everybody else. Yeah. And, uh, we've got yeah. some good, Full good episodes early. coming up. So let's get into the episode. I'm nurse Jessica Seitz, along with nurse Erica. We're nurses uncorked, the podcast that takes nursing facts with nursing comedy and makes a little cocktail out of it. <laughs> Okay, everybody, welcome back to Nurses Uncorked. It is myself, um, Nurse Jessica Seitz, um, alongside with my co-host, Nurse Erica. And I'm super excited today. This is a really exciting podcast for us. We have one of the lead representatives of the American Nurses Association here on our podcast um, to talk here uh, to nurses, for nurses, and we are super, super excited about it. We have Dr. Debbie Hatmaker here with us. Welcome, Debbie, to Nurses Welcome. Uncorked. Well, I'm so pleased to be here with you to talk about my favorite subject, the nursing profession. So glad Mine to be Mine too. Here. And yeah. I, I apologize. I probably shouldn't just go right in and get comfortable and call you Debbie. It should, no, we, please do. Please oh, do. Oh, no, yes. that's okay. Yes. No, I'm like, I should say Dr. Hatmaker, so I, no, I no. First name, first name. Oh, yeah. well, thank you. I'm, yes. I think I'm just kind of, I'm kind of used to that, but we really appreciate you being on. So before we get into stuff, I just wanted to kind of tell people a little bit about um, what Dr. Hatmaker's role is at um, the American Nurses Association. And if I get anything wrong, please feel free to chime in and let, let us know. So, um, Dr. Hatmaker is Chief Nursing Officer of the ANA Enterprise, which leads the implementation of programmatic strategy to advance comprehensive practice, policy, advocacy, and credentialing. Um, I believe this, this represents the nation's 4 million plus registered nurses. Yes. Um, and uh, some of Dr. Hatmaker's background is um, she got her BSN from the College of Nursing in Memphis, Tennessee, um, and has a diverse background in public health and maternal child health, which I hold near and dear to my heart as a labor and delivery nurse. Yes. Um, and you also served on the faculty at the Medical College of Georgia School of Nursing for 16 years while you were also a sexual assault nurse examiner. Um, at the same time, and we recently did an episode with a um, sane nurse. Um, we had a whole long episode and learned all about that. So I find that whole area very, very uh, fascinating, as Erica does does as well. Mm -hmm. um, some things in your past. I believe you were president of the Georgia Nurses Association from 1999 to 2002, vice president of the ANA from 2006 to 2010, and also served two terms from 2007 to 2011 as president of ANCC. Am I doing good so far, Dr. Hatmaker? You're doing great. In fact, uh, it just demonstrates the fact that I've been around a long time. So. That's a, yeah. It's amazing. You've got a lot, a lot of experience. And one of the most impressive things um, inducted uh, in 2012 as a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, well, well done. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you've got decades to do that work, and it, and it's always uh, it's always the work you love to do. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a, it's always a pleasure. You know, e even when the work gets hard, and it does get hard sometimes, but uh, it's been a joy for me uh, to be a nurse. I wouldn't have done anything else. I think that's how a lot of us feel. That's how we get into this this area, right? 
thank you so much for joining us. We we really are looking forward to this episode. I think it's going to be important for nurses. And so we have a list of questions. Uh, I thought we'd just kind of go back and forth between Jessica and sure. I. And if it's okay with you, Jessica, I think I'll go ahead and start. Sure. Have at it. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to start by expressing my appreciation to the ANA for leading a national effort to achieve reimbursement of nursing services. This is something I'm passionate about. Part of the effort includes leveraging the national provider identifier, the NPI, as a unique nurse identifier. Can you explain for those that may not understand the significance of all of this? All right. Well, actually, as a part of our strategic plan, we have uh, a broad objective focus on the value of nursing, because those of us who do uh, are in nursing practice have known for a long time, as do many of our colleagues in healthcare, the value that nurses bring to the work. But with the exception of some advanced practice providers, nurses are not reimbursed directly um, they are reimbursed through our various systems, insurance systems, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, into the facilities. And so we often say sometimes that nursing is a part of the facility fee. We sometimes say the room and board fee, uh, but it's factored in because, uh, in other words, patients don't leave the hospital with a line item that says, this is the cost of my nursing care if I was there. So. It, it appears quite invisible, the value that nurses bring. And we have a two-year research project going on in which we are developing a conceptual model around value, the value that nurses bring to the work that they do. Um, it, we're going to be publishing a paper soon on that to really get at the conceptual model around value and begin to tease that out. That's the goal, to really be able to attach an economic value that nurses bring into the work that they do. And hopefully, it'll take us a while, but hopefully we can get, begin to push against these um, models, these payment models that would allow for uh, a bit more of a direct reimbursement for the nursing care and hopefully those funds would go back into nursing so that we can focus on um, how to improve those resources and improve the patient care that we do. Um, quite often in our current financial models, nursing is seen as a cost because it is factored in the amount of nurses that are hired or uh, it's seen on the expense sheet. So quite often when facilities or hospitals have have constraints or they have to cut their budgets, the first place they go are some of their largest costs, which are tend to be, um, you know, in personnel. And nursing, of course, is typically the largest uh, group of, of staff uh, for a hospital facility. So we really want to be able to demonstrate um, these are the these these are the numbers that you need to give the best patient care, high quality patient care, very safe patient care, and this is the economic value that we bring uh, to this work. And therefore, we want to be able to demonstrate that in such a way that economic models can make that happen. Again, it's going to be a, a while. It's not an easy change, as you might imagine, since many of our reimbursement models are set up within the federal government and through insurance agencies, but we're going to push really hard and, and we're very excited about kicking off this two-year research project. Thank you. It's, it's so important and I look forward to the uh, end results of that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Erica and I, this is a different uh, little topic here, but we're going to Ohio next week. Um, on Friday, there's a rally that's being organized by the family of Tristan Kate Smith. And I don't know if you're familiar with this story or not, but she's a nurse that took her own life um, and wrote a letter titled, A Letter to My Abuser, the abuser being her hospital. Uh, Erica and I were curious if you were aware of the letter and what your thoughts were on on that letter and that awful situation. Yeah. Uh, we we certainly were aware and 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 were 
dismayed as everyone was as it relates to um, how challenging it must be to be in a work environment that feels so bad that that was your option to deal with it. I, I, I think we all just felt um, so, so, you know, so challenged by the pain that she must have felt. And, and, and it certainly, I think, renewed our push to address this whole body of work around incivility, violence, and to also increase our efforts and our push around nurse suicide. Um, yeah. We did a great deal of work with collaborating organizations. We actually have tools available. It's all open. It's not not just for members um, to really look at some resources for nurses to help deal with nurse suicide. We brought in some subject matter experts to help really in uh, with us to develop those materials. We we continue to want to push those out. Make sure. There's awareness of those and, and really look at, uh, you know, driving down that sense. But it has to happen both ways. I go back to my earlier comment about not putting all the onus on the individual, which is the organization has some accountability here. And then certainly we want to make sure that the individual knows that there are resources available and we want to make sure that you know, either an employer's wellness program or a really focus on a positive work environment drives the use of any resources that might be helpful. Um, so where I, can I, they I find those resources? Is it on the website? They're, they're on the web page. Yeah, they're on okay. the web page in nursingworld.org and suicide prevention should, I haven't tried it lately, but suicide prevention uh, should get you to the the right link on the materials, but um, and I'll certainly double check that. But um, but I just I just saw it not too long ago that that certainly we're still talking a lot about that. Yeah. Uh, while Tristan's case and outcome was extreme, it's by no means um, isolated, unfortunately. And even if you remove the outcome of her case, what she said in the letter, I think really resonates with the vast majority of nurses everywhere. Um, she articulated it skillfully, uh, but mm -hmm. that is a very common theme and feeling, what she put in, in that letter. Yeah. I think we could all see ourselves in, in, in Tristan, we all saw ourselves mm -hmm. in that letter. She described how nurses everywhere felt, especially uh, brand new. I can't even imagine being a brand new nurse starting when the pandemic hit and um, trying to acclimate yourself to a whole new new world of uh, being an RN and being thrown thrown into that and trying to keep up with the expectations and not let people down and um, just very disheartening, but she definitely captivated a, and had a way of writing it that, that we all felt, you know, yeah. it's just very tough. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'd like to think, I'm not saying it's always perfect, but I'd like to think the best employers recognize that um, not only is it important to them to address work environment issues because of the humanity of the staff that that, that work there uh, and the drive to have a positive work environment. If you only take the business perspective, which I know none of us do, but if you only do, it, it's the best for the best for the organization. It's the best for patient care. It uh, is to really look at how do you make sure that you're focused on the best environment and not just the numerical bottom line, so to right. speak. So I think needing to really look at that and have a comprehensive view is important. And, and I'd like to think the best employers do just that, but, you know, there's always room. Uh, for Sadly, I don't stuff. think that many of them do, unfortunately. Um, there's just not as many of case. them. There's not as many of the good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Since um, COVID, have you noticed, has there been a decline in, in membership with, with nurses and, and the ANA? Yeah, that's a great question. 
uh, and let me back up just a little bit and say for the decade that led up to the pandemic, um, ANA's membership was growing very steadily. And that was true for many of our uh, other specialty nursing organizations. They had seen, I think, some real growth as they focused on uh, the value and the resources that they bring to nurses as well. At the very beginning in 2020, the, the first few months of the pandemic, ANA was able to mount a huge response for nurses on kind of what they needed during the pandemic, which was a great deal around education, around what was going on. So we were able to quickly turn around educational resources that would help support them during the pandemic. We were doing a lot of advocacy work, um, just a great deal of effort very quickly. Uh, and so we saw early in the pandemic, our numbers shoot up very strong. And then in 20, 2021 and 2022, as nurses were really, I think, beginning to feel the after effects of that intensity of the pandemic, the constraints on their finances, as all, a lot of people were, um, that growth kind of leveled out. To, it, we didn't have dramatic drops, but it mm -hmm. really did level out. The good news is, is that um, for 2023 and the early first quarter of this year, um, our growth has jumped over 5%, and we're continuing to push really hard to drive that go growth but because we want nurses to see the value um, that they can gain of connecting with a professional association. Uh, and while ANA is the membership, a professional membership organization for all registered nurses. We also acknowledge that um, nurses often join their specialty association. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. I belong, you know, I over the years I've belonged to a number of specialty nursing organizations. But ANA is that foundational organization that goes across all issues related to nursing. And and we're very excited about this growth. We're continuing to push really hard um, to try and grow that and make sure that we're doing the work that nurses want us to do. We do a lot of conversation with our members and other nurses so that they can identify issues, make mm -hmm. sure we're in line with kind of their top issues. Um, and in our most recent impact report, our kind of strategic report out from 2023, we added over 40,000 new members last year. So again, very excited, but it takes a lot of work, uh, both on our member acquisition and retention efforts, but also we have to make sure that programmatically we're giving nurses a reason to want to join with us and to mm -hmm. stay with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for, right. for clarifying that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, currently, there are about 974,000 LPN LVNs throughout the U.S., that are not eligible to become members of the ANA. Would the ANA ever consider allowing LPN LVNs to join? Well, that's a very timely question. I will tell you, historically, this question has come up in the past at ANA. ANA was started as a professional association for registered nurses. Mm -hmm. And in the previous discussion that was held several years ago, uh, it wasn't about being exclusionary. It was really more focused about uh, could we do the work that would be meaningful and important for LPNs and their scope of practice? Because we do a great deal of advocacy work, some of which really relates to RN scope of practice. But we had a little bit of discussion, and of course, there are professionals, so there are associations that do, that are for LPNs, LVNs. But we also, I think, especially saw during the pandemic uh, an increased focus on the interprofessional team, healthcare team. And certainly when we say we represent the nurses, the interest of nurses, we want to be inclusionary. And so uh, our board of directors is having a discussion right now because in order to do that, it would require a bylaws change for us and our member representatives vote on our bylaws. So. Uh, the wheels are starting to turn, I think, to begin to take that back to our members and really look at, can we be more inclusionary 
and focus on across all nurses in, uh, as registered nurses or LPN. So more to come, hopefully have Good. more on that uh, in the near term. Yeah. That's great. I'm happy to hear that you are looking at that because I'm sure you can imagine how invalidating it must feel to the LPNs and LVNs out there. So that's exciting. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, and we do talk with them. We do talk to their professional association. We also don't want them to believe that we're taking away from their interest and their own professional association, uh, just like we wouldn't do that with a specialty nursing organization as well. Uh, but I think there is certainly a strong opportunity to be inclusive. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So this next question is a very near and dear question to my heart because I ha myself have been uh, retaliated against from from higher ups in my job. So my my question would be, what is the ANA doing to address like toxic, unsafe work environments? Um, how are they supporting nurses? and arming them with information on how to navigate like these toxic work environments um, and, and things when, when nurses do try to speak out or do try to do what's right in, in, in the workplace, but they end up being retaliated against. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we do have a, a number of specific programs that talk about work environment in particular. In fact, our, our staffing work over the last several years, it won't surprise anyone who's listening that Staffing has been the number one pain point for nurses. It continues to be so. Right. It's an area we continue to work on. And invariably, the work environment shows up as one of the major challenges in that space. So it's not always just about not having sufficient numbers of nurses to provide safe staffing, uh, but it's also about the work environment, which is uh, really focused on uh, uh, developing a positive practice environment, really looking at what is the environment both on a particular unit and with a facility, um, what are we doing to be responsive? We certainly uh, have efforts around uh, that are uh, around civility, incivility and bullying, uh, a no tolerance kind of focus on that as we encourage that. We work closely in the advocacy space with um, with uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, to really look at what are ways that we can then bring regulatory uh, requirements into that space. Uh, we just sent a letter, for example, that had uh, 59 organizations signed on to it for OSHA in the area of workplace violence. So while I, I think, as you described, some kind of what we sometimes call lateral violence or bullying mm -hmm. or, or toxic work environments. We also know that workplace violence issues related to patient to nurse or family to nurse um, also happens, and it is creating a great deal of difficulty uh, for the work environment as well. So we, we're pressing not only on the education front, on the standards development front, but certainly working with through the regulatory agencies to bring action into facilities around requirements and what they need to put in place. I will say to you, the workplace environment, uh, the workplace violence issue has gotten so challenging that I think employers are really taking note as well. And they realize that as difficult as the staffing situation is, um, the, the issues around shortage and having sufficient nurses to provide care, they have to address workplace environment and workplace violence issues in order to retain nurses and to provide them the best environment to provide patient care. Um, right. We're, we currently have a work group on the workplace violence issue that is pulling together uh, best practices across a number of organizations because, as you might imagine, Employers have tried lots of things, you know, security measures, uh, education. Uh, you know, sometimes we go into facilities and we see signs about violence and bullying and, and, and as reminders to visitors. But really, we're also pulling together and, and trying to look at there's lots of things work, uh, happening, but what is truly effective? So um, a, a task force right now is really looking to pull all those best practices, the ones that are most impactful, 
the ones that are truly bringing down issues of workplace violence or toxic work environment. And we'll be pulling that together and really identifying those as best practices and pulling those out. I'll also mention that our credentialing center, the American Nurses Credentialing Center, um, has the Magnet Recognition Program focused on nursing excellence in facilities and the Pathway to Excellence Recognition Program, which is a positive practice environment um, program. And we tell organizations all the time, even if you never plan to become recognized as a magnet facility or recognized as a pathway facility, use the standards. And the standards in particular around pathway and the environment, the focus on the environment and retention of nurses and nurse satisfaction is a major factor. So anyone can access the standards and really look at, here's a blueprint that I can use to really drive for a better work environment. And, and I believe the incentives are really there right now with employers because they're not going to keep nurses and they're not going to be able to keep their facilities open without nurses. Right. I think a lot of the confusion lies with, it's not just so much like um, trying to find a way and figuring out what's the best way to decrease workplace violence, but a lot of it is confusion in the reporting system, a confusion in when it does happen, what what are nurses supposed to do? And there's no organized anything nationally. Um, you know, a lot of people do, they lean towards their managers and that, that goes into play again with toxic work environments and, and, and bullying. Cause a lot of times they're kind of bullied into submission almost, um, to not report things. Um, so it just seems like, I, I feel like if there was a more consistent way of, um, being a nurse or or anybody that's working, not just a nurse, but they're having an understanding of what the proper chains is, what you should be doing, A, B, C, and D, that I think that it would it would alleviate a lot of frustration from nurses. Well, and that's one of the reasons why we would would we really want a regulatory agency at the federal level like OSHA mm -hmm. to be able to set standards right. that hospitals will need to follow, so there is some consistency to your uh, point. Yes. All right. Uh, in September of last year, 2023, the ANA came out publicly in support of the Nurse Staffing Standards for Hospital Patient Safety and Quality Care Act. This is after years of opposing all proposed mandated staffing ratios and instead promoting staffing committees and task forces which are not enforceable. This has left many wondering why now and what is the ANA actually doing to help move this forward? That's a great question, and I've I've actually been here both as a volunteer and and as uh, on staff over those years as I saw the evolution of the organization's position on this. As you might imagine, because the ANA has fifty state affiliates on really any issue, but staffing is one of them. We had states that had differing perspectives on staffing. Um, you know, sometimes it's about red and blue and what you can pass politically if it takes uh, if it takes state legislation to pass or whether or not uh, a state might be union friendly or not and whether or not regulations or legislation could change. Um, so a number of years ago, we focused on staffing committees, which gave the nurse a voice in making decisions around staffing. We, we've always felt that the best case scenario is if nurses can make decisions around what the staffing needs are. So we started a number of years ago with the concept of staffing committees. We had uh, around seven states over the years that passed laws that required staffing committees. And if, if the laws had worked, the way they were intended, I think many of us believe we would have been in a much better place, at least in those seven states, and we would have had data to, data to show uh, some improvements. 
But what typically happens uh, in many states, unfortunately, not just on staffing, but in many laws that require an employer to do something, the question becomes, well, what if the employer doesn't do it? Or what if they don't do it well? Um, what is the penalty that right. the state is willing to, you know, to pose? Mm -hmm. And what we saw in those seven states is very few, if any, penalties. And while in some states they could check the box, yes, we have a staffing committee, and yes, nurses sit on those and make recommendations around staffing, but, oh, in this situation, we couldn't follow the staffing guidelines or we couldn't follow the recommendations, and therefore there was no really teeth in the law to make it happen. So we, we really did put a, a strong effort against that. Um, some of our states, particularly in states that are more difficult uh, or more challenging legislatively to pass things, are really still looking to, to focus on staffing committees. But I think that the time just came in which, okay, this, this great idea, mm -hmm. tried to put it in practice, Here's the issues. Uh, it's time to really look at um, a, a requirement around staffing ratios that will put some teeth into the way we move about that. And of course, I, probably everyone knows California was the first state many years ago to pass a mandated ratios. Um, Oregon being the second as they're starting now to move toward implementation. And we had um, in the last legislative session last year about 19 states that looked at legislation specific to staffing. Not all of them were staffing ratios, but at least attempting to move and push on the staffing issues. Um, so I, I think as employers have not solved the problem, not worked with nurses to solve the problem, not really... Uh, even in those states that had laws around staffing committees not work to have the best outcomes, the pressure now becomes to, um, okay, it's it's time to really look at, at more definitive solutions. Um, it, it's going to be a challenge. We did support, as you noted, um, the federal staffing bill. We think there's rooms for some uh, improvement in the language. So we're having conversations with co-sponsors. Um, in order to look at some language improvement. Uh, the, our biggest challenge right now, of course, is that our Congress is not very effective in moving legislation, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop pushing on the advocacy side. I've been personally involved with uh, the staffing committees uh, for many years, both as bedside staff and then in a manager role. And so I can tell you from my personal experience that um, they are often, in my opinion, nothing more than a red herring to distract us and make us feel like we are doing something actionable. But as I mentioned, they are just not enforceable. So, um, you know, we, we've got to get mandated ratios in place because if it's not mandated, employers, health systems will absolutely take advantage of it as much as they can. So I'm glad to see that uh, the ANA did finally come out last year in support of this. I think that was a really big step for the ANA okay. as an organization. And uh, nurses are just kind of sitting back and watching to see what you're going to do in the future with that. Yep. Well, we, we will keep pressing, certainly, at the federal level, whether it's around Congress or even, you know, right now, for example, not easy to get anything through Congress. So we're still having conversations with, with our regulatory agencies, with CMS, with OSHA, with a number of organizations about, well, can we move regulations if Congress isn't going to move? But at the meantime, we still work directly. We, we work very closely with the Oregon Nurses Association um, when, when they were proposing their bill at the state level wrote letters of support, really looked at ways to assist them in moving that. Um, certainly, they shared that language across other states who are really looking at whether or not their political environment is such that they might be able to move in that direction. So 
Um, as with most things that take a le uh, legislative fix, uh, it, it usually is not done quickly, but we, uh, we continue the effort and all that support. And then I'll also say that at the same time, we had uh, a staffing think tank really focused on more short-term solutions that we believe are also important. Um, and uh, a staffing task force that really could look at some more systemic, long-term issues that impact staffing and how to move those. Because I think we probably all could say, even if we could wave our magic wand and uh, ratios could pass at the federal level tomorrow, there are still other aspects of the work environment and, and of other aspects of staffing that also need to be addressed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This question is one that I know that nurses would be very frustrated if I didn't ask. So, okay. so I'm, going to, I'm going to ask it. Do you feel, this is a two-part question, in retrospect, do you think the ANA um, should have handled its response to COVID? and what happened with the pandemic differently. Um, because I will say the conception, and it may be a misconception, but the nurses perceived that the ANA initially kind of spoke out during the pandemic, and then it, it appeared that there was silence. That, that's the appearance of it. I'm not saying that that's necessarily what was going on, but do you feel like there was anything that, we always learn things in, in hindsight. I mean, I, I know that, but do you feel like there's anything that the ANA could have done differently? Um, and do you feel like there was a lack of response or, or was there adequate response? Right. Um, I, first, let me say that, that I'm very proud of the response that we had during the pandemic. And, and I will tell you that the, 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 the goals of the organization, particularly that first year of the pandemic, mm -hmm. is we pushed a lot of our other work to the back burner. If it wasn't going to directly impact uh, the, the pandemic response, nurses who were engaged in the pandemic response, we kind of shifted and pulled a lot of our resources in to really focus on what nurses were telling us that they needed. And we were working with another a, a number of other organizations to stand up, for example, educational webinars, you know, on, on issues, uh, infectious disease, how to respond, that, that many nurses needed some additional education on. So we did uh, and had over half a million registrations in the U.S. and more in a, about 190 countries, because we certainly know that there were even countries outside the U.S. that couldn't respond. Uh, respond that quickly or, or with the same level of resources. But we did over a dozen webinars on various topics. Um, we offered free rooms early in the pandemic through a partnership with Hilton Hotels. For, uh, um, we offered over 80,000 rooms for nurses uh, who in that initial phase were very um, anxious about bringing the virus home right. to their families. Uh, we uh, had a great, uh, um, we shifted our website to a real focus on COVID and the pandemic uh, with a large collection of information and links to various um, federal agencies and federal resources as well. And our foundation launched uh, an ongoing, we continue it to this day, regular survey called Pulse on the Nation's Nurses where we were asking them on a regular basis, what are your top issues? What are you dealing with? How do you believe it needs to be addressed? Uh, and certainly the issues around well-being and mental health came out early in the pandemic. And we knew they were going to be long lasting, that mm -hmm. even when the right. pandemic went away, that they wouldn't all of a sudden go away. Um, so our well-being initiative and focus on mental health continues as our foundation is give, has given a great deal of money uh, to stand up a number of well-being resources, uh, well-being engagements and apps, some of which we stood up quickly, we tested them, we were like, is this working, is it not working? Let's really try to move quickly and see what works best. 
um, and, and really we continue to do that. Um, as well, we knew that a lingering issue after the pandemic would, would be burnout. Mm -hmm. um, so our foundation has invested along with um, United Health Foundation uh, a, uh, a great deal of funding to launch the stress and burnout prevention pilot in which we're testing in a number of facilities. Can we prevent burnout as opposed to waiting for it to happen and then trying to deal with it? are things that we can do. Uh, it's a nurse customized program to really get at that. So all of this work, as I describe it, it wasn't that we were never doing anything in well-being mm -hmm. or health or stress, but I can tell you that um, there were major um, initiatives stood up during that time during the pandemic. And then I think probably the work that wasn't as visible, except for maybe those people that are very tuned in to um, a and A engaging with the administration, and as you remember, we had some difficulty with the, the administration at that time, trying to stay focused on the pandemic and and what uh, what healthcare providers needed. Um, but we were having regular meetings with a good many of the agencies about uh, PPE. Why can't we get PPE? What are they doing? Uh, how can we help drive that? How can we make sure nurses are getting what they need? What are the standards set in place? And of course, we work alongside many of the other nursing associations that we're having, for example, in the education space, having to close their programs or shift to 100% simulation and, and, and mm -hmm. all of those measures. So I, I think I can understand maybe when things are not highly visible or maybe they're not as focused on the immediate pain points or concerns nurses might be having mm -hmm. and they, they're not as aware of some of these things. But I can tell you I'm, I'm very proud of the response Looking back, were there some other things we could have done? Sure. I think everybody, when you look back on, mm -hmm. on the work that you do and you think about what more could we have done, we could probably name some things or move faster on some things. Um, and, and on the things we could move by ourselves, right. like the education aspect, I feel like we moved very fast. On the things that required partnerships, whether that was with the the, the administration or Congress or whatever, those were, those were sometimes painfully slow for sure. Do you think like in the yeah. beginning, maybe there was a bigger social media presence possibly from the ANA? Like I saw your interview with Wolf Blitzer on CNN um, and, and maybe the social media presence wasn't so much as, as when it first hit and maybe that's where the disconnect is coming. Like, you, you know, you're kind of saying you're, guys were doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get an answer for, for nurses so no, that they feel no, like they I, weren't abandoned, you know? I, I think you make a very good point. And, and I'm going to say to you, we say this to ourselves internally all the time on the, especially the staff that are working on the programs area. Mm -hmm. We're, we're really good at doing the programmatic work. We are not good at telling people what we've been doing or are doing. And in fact, we often have that dialogue with our communication staff who remind us of that very point. Um, in fact, I, I, uh, I told someone earlier today I was going to have the chance to do the podcast, and they're asking, are you going to put that on social media? Are you going to do – because we're re we certainly know that nurses or, you know, uh, get a lot of their information now around social media. Correct. They, yeah. they gather that. Um, and and we're getting better at it. Do I think we have uh, a ways to go? I, I absolutely we do. Uh, but it is a focus for us to get better at it. We, we also have a new project in our membership uh, area um, called Project MZ, which is a, a, a real attention around millennials and Gen Z, which is mm -hmm. to do even better, learn even more about what they want and how we're delivering the information and where our gaps are. So if if they're telling us one thing and we think, well, we're doing that, but so where where's the gap in trying to share that information or engage them in that, get their input into the work? So I, I think we're really, uh, we know that's an area that we 
um, want to improve on, are improving on, it's certainly in our plan. But I think you make a very good point. In the pandemic, we probably fell back into this uh, activity of doing the work right. and not not talking about it as much as we needed to, or not sharing, or even maybe even sometimes engaging nurses as much as we would have liked with that kind of frantic pace that we all were in. Yeah. Well, I do want to compliment <laughs> you guys for reaching out to us because I don't know if we said that in the beginning, but this was the ANA reaching out to us to be and speak on the podcast. True. So we, we do really appreciate that, that you took the initiative to do that. We would be glad to have you guys on any time. Um, yeah. well, mm-hmm. Thank you for the opportunity. We, we, again, we're, we, we want to make sure people know about the work and have the opportunity to influence the work. I think that's important too. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hatmaker, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to speak for nurses everywhere. Uh, in regards and response to your last uh, answer, with all due respect, Uh, webinars and links on a website are useless when you're wearing garbage bags and stapling your mask together for the second, third week in a row. You're absolutely correct when you say the ANA was not visible. What I think we want you to understand is that we were watching. We were looking for a response. And the silence was deafening. It was deafening to us. And to nurses everywhere, it spoke volumes. I personally can recall seeing uh, the former ANA president, Ernest Grant, uh, testifying, I believe, before the Senate, I believe, Mm -hmm. once regarding PPE early in the pandemic. That is my only recollection of the ANA doing anything substantial for nurses in 2020, 2021. Uh, so while you may have been doing things behind the scenes, we were not aware of it. And really? I, that, that has caused perhaps irreparable damage within the nursing profession. I think that uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to try and repair that. Well, Erica, I I appreciate you speaking to that directly and the opportunity to kind of respond to that. Uh, I I do think, going back to my comment, I I do think there was a lot of work. But again, we were not making the connections that we needed to and we know uh, we need to. And I would say we're working hard right now to get much better at it. I talked to a lot of nurses, Uh, Dr. Grant, Ernest Grant spoke to a lot of nurses early in the pandemic. And we did have a a good amount of feedback from nurses who, um, you know, again, I hear you about the webinars. You've got to be able to to do that when when it works. Not not all webinars work uh, uh, or or, uh, using that as a, as a means of, of, you know, connection doesn't always work, but we did hear from a lot of nurses that they found value in the work. They have not resonated across um, as much as we wanted it to. It may have not touched some nurses, and so we missed some opportunities as well. I certainly hope and would like to think it's not irreputable, irreparable, it's a hard word. Say that correctly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because we want to work every day to make sure that the work that we're doing is relevant. Uh, do we sometimes miss the mark? Absolutely. And we want uh, we want people to tell us what what we're where we can do better and, and how they can give input. But we're very open to that. So thank you for that feedback. I was say, boy, it seems like Erica told you. <laughs> I, had I had to, to put a little I had to put a little humor in there, Erica. You know you know me. That's okay. That's thank you right. for thank you um, for answering that, Dr. Hatmaker. I know that's a difficult question. Thank you. I'm I'm here for the difficult questions as well as the easy ones. So all good. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. We are so grateful that Dr. Hatmaker is being uh very generous with her time and uh it looks like we might have enough for a two part episode. So we're gonna end this one here. 
make sure you come back next week to hear uh, some more hard hitting questions with Dr. Hatmaker of the American Nurses Association. Thank you.